afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, the MTSU Spring 2024 Honors Lecture Series on Mental Health and Living a Good Life. Um, I'm Dr. Mary Evans. I am a resident faculty member in the University Honors College and I'm a research professor of history here at MTSU. I'm pleased today to introduce Dr. Michelle Stevens, who is our speaker for today. She's a licensed professional counselor and has had over 20 years of clinical experience working with clients of all ages who've experienced underlying issues of trauma. And at MTSU, she's a professor of educational leadership in the College of Education here and is the director, also under the umbrella of the College of Education, of the Center for Fairness, Justice, and Equity. Prior to that appointment, being the director of FJE, Dr. Stevens served as a professor in the professional counseling program for 14 years here at MTSU and provided supervision for school counseling and clinical mental health counseling students throughout their programs as they matriculated on into serving in public education and education beyond our university. Prior to joining the clinical medical health facility here at MTSU, Dr. Stevens has taught various other places, Youngstown State University in Ohio, Cleveland State University in Ohio, Kent State University also in Ohio, and was a K-12 school-based therapist in Akron. Her scholarly areas of interest include the study of the implications of unjust and inequitable practices connected to historical trauma on under-resourced communities, as well as mentoring throughout the pipeline of need. And based on that research, She's speaking to us today on mental health and cultural humility. Dr. Michelle Stevens. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, y'all gonna talk back to me? <laughs> Good, afternoon. Good afternoon. It's always interesting to hear yourself on paper. Right here. Like, oh, who is that person? So thank you so much and thank you for the invitation. Um, I am so excited to have a conversation about uh, two things that I'm really um, passionate about. Um, this is going to be a lecture. I have discovered Canva finally. Um, so as you see, I'm very proud of this presentation and the graphics. So. Um, every once in a while I need you to go, ooh, ah, <laughs> even though I'm sure you've all used it, okay? Um, but I've been a PowerPoint person forever. So um, this is going to be a bit of a conversation in addition to a lecture. I hope that's okay. Um, because I think it's important for us to really kind of talk about what our understanding of mental health is, mental wellness, and also that second term there, cultural humility. Has anyone in the room attended a cultural humility lab on campus? Okay, that's, that's, that's okay, that's good. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my role right now. Um, I am the director for the Center for Parents, Justice, and Equity, and one of the things that we do um, through the FJE, try to say that fast a couple of times, Center for Parents, Justice, and Equity. I can say it because I do it all the time. But we call it the FJE. Um, so one of the things that we do is we go to different classrooms and different um, organizations on campus, and we talk about this term here, cultural humility. Um, and we'll talk about what it is in just a minute, but basically it is the ability to relate and to have a relationship um, and work with people who are different than you. Right? Everyone is different than you. There's only one you. And so we have a conversation and we talk, we have a couple of activities that we do and we talk about what does that look like? What are some of the aspects of culture and things like that? We're not going to do that today because it's usually about an hour. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about some aspects of culture. We're also going to talk about how culture can be related to our mental health. Um, but I'd like to get some of your opinions about that. Okay? Cool. So, We'll get started. So, I just did this, but we're going to do, we're going to talk a little bit about mental health, what you think your, what, what is your definition of mental health when we, when we think about that. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about overall wellness, and then we'll tie in cultural humility. What's interesting is, as I was preparing for this, typed in, I, I did a very scientific search of Google, um, <laughs> and I typed in cultural humility and mental health or mental wellness and things like that. And on college campuses, it 100% is, I would say, and this makes sense, related, right? In terms of psychological safety, has anyone heard about that word, psychological safety? Yeah? Anyone want to be brave and say what you think it is? Uh, I mean, psychological safety sounds like it would be, you know, keeping your mind safe, keeping yourself safe from your mind. Oh, I like that. Okay, so keeping yourself safe, right. That's definitely one. And then let's think about keeping your safe, yourself safe psychologically, right, or emotionally. What are some things that you think need to happen in order to feel emotionally safe? Yes. Time to yourself. What's that? Time to yourself. Time to yourself. All of that. Yep, time to yourself. Yes. Setting boundaries. Setting boundaries. That's great. Yes, Having people you can be yourself with. Oh, I love that. Being, have, so having an environment, being in an environment where you can feed yourself, right? And so thinking about, yes? Learning mindfulness. Learning mindfulness. Okay, we're ready. We are, we are <laughs> ready. Um, that is absolutely the case, right? All of those things, in addition to some of those things that we talked about, all of those things that you offer, psychological safety also involves your environment, right? Feeling safe emotionally. And when we think about cultural competency or anything like that, or even the acknowledgement that there are differences and similarities, that can lead to psychological safety and increase them. Does that make sense? So that's kind of how I'm connecting it. All right. No, no, no. I'll leave it back. I'm giving you the answer. I was going to ask you. Is there a way to go back? My clicker's not really in. There it okay. is. Hmm. Had to click it a couple of times. Okay, so just kind of throwing out what are some, when you think about mental health, what are some things that come to mind? How would you define it? What are some things that kind of encompass mental health? I think one word that comes to mind is stability. Stability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The ability to self reflect. Great, yeah, the ability to self-reflect. I'd also say any damage you've taken that isn't external, like trauma and just other things in your life that impacted you. Uh -huh. so, the, so when we think about mental health, we can think about maybe impairments mm -hmm. that come along with that, right? So um, things that have either been traumatizing or they have... Uh, psychologically or emotionally damaged you, or been kind of hard for you. Mm -hmm. That's good. Oh, yes. How you handle your emotions. Yeah, how you handle your emotions. Are you able to regulate? There are times, has everyone heard the term regulate? Being regulated or dysregulated? Yes. Coping with stress. Yeah, coping with stress. Mm -hmm. And acknowledging the fact that we have it and then coping. Right? Like you have to acknowledge, oh, I'm, I'm experiencing this. Sometimes we don't even know that that's what it is. Yeah. Well. Anything else comes to mind? Okay. Yeah, so let's look at this. So it's a state of well being in which the individual realizes their own abilities, they can cope with uh, normal stresses. and. Notice I said normal, right? There are some things that we are not supposed to cope with, cope with it, right? Um, we'll talk about it in a, in a second. Um, so the normal stresses of life, like too much homework, or you have an exam, or a paper due, right? Um, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community. So mental health and well-being are fundamental to our collective and individual ability as humans to think, to emote, so we talked about um, having the emotions and being able to do something with it, um, to interact with each other, to earn a living, and enjoy life. So this is sort of this broad, overarching definition, right? And I have the, the sources at the end. 
um, of what mental health is. So when we think about mental health, also we have to think about mental wellness. Oftentimes, I went back on purpose, oftentimes when we think about mental health, we don't necessarily think of it in a, in a way, in a sense where it's positive, right? Um, maybe you think, um, you know, someone has mental health issues or mental health concerns. We want to also think about it in terms of wellness, right? When I think about wellness, I think about prevention. I think about being able to um, kind of prevent some of the negative things from impacting us, right? So when we look at mental wellness, there are three different things that I want to focus on. Emotional well-being, and this is the perceived life satisfaction, how happy someone is. Um, cheerfulness and peacefulness. Psychological well-being, and I talked about psychological safety earlier, but self-acceptance, pers personal growth, including our openness to new experiences. And this openness part I'll come back to when we talk about cultural humility. Uh, optimism, hopefulness. Having a purpose in life, feeling like you, you have a purpose. Um, having control of your own environment. When we talk about some of the aspects um, of wellness, we'll talk about that. Your environment is really important. Spirituality, self-direction, and positive relationships. So being able to relate to other folks helps to improve our wellness. Okay? Um, and then when we think about our social well-being, this, this involves social acceptance, beliefs in a potential of people, the society as a whole. We're getting ready to in, embark upon um, a wonderful time when you think about the election season, <laughs> right? When you think about um, having faith in people, sometimes it's hard during this time, right, to think about. Um, I saw something so beautiful the other day. Someone dropped something. It was so simple. Someone dropped something um, in a public space, and they and someone else stopped, picked it up, and they talked. Right? Some like there are small things like that that make, that give me hope and humanity. Especially thinking about all of the things that we see on TV, all the things that we're experiencing, all the things that are happening in the world. Right? So the social well-being is really important because it's impacted by so many things that are happening around us. Okay. Um, believe in beliefs and potential of people and society as a whole, personal self-worth and usefulness to society. Also, when we think about social well-being, having that sense of community is really important. So when we think about belongingness, right? So as students on campus, how many of you are part of organizations that you feel like help with your belongingness? Yeah. So that's important because that gives you that sense of community and should help you with your emotional wellness, all right, your mental wellness. Okay. Um, so when we think about what wellness is, wellness is active. You have to intentionally pursue wellness. So that comes with our different pursuit of activities, the choices and lifestyles that we lead, that, um, that leads to holistic health. When we talk about some of the dimensions of wellness, here are some that we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, so we think about physical wellness, mental and emotional wellness, spiritual, recreational, social, environmental, occupational, and financial. And so wellness, right, as we're looking at it from that standpoint, is very holistic also. So um, be, being attentional, <laughs> paying attention to wellness leads to overall holistic health, right? So when we think about prevention, when we think about making sure that these different dimensions of wellness, that we're able to balance them or at least be able to identify um, how you're doing in those different areas. How many of you have seen something called the wellness wheel? I should have included it on this PowerPoint. The wellness wheel Okay, so 
So the wellness wheel includes all of the different dimensions, right? So um, I usually do an activity where I have this wheel and it has all of the different dimensions, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, social, environmental, financial, recreational, all of those things on there. Um, and what you do is you start to think about where you are in each of those dimensions in your life right now. So I tend to, like, so for instance, physical, a healthy body through exercise, nutrition, and sleep. I don't always do well in this area, the sleep one, right? <laughs> and a lot of times it's because I'm stressed or I might not be eating right, like all of those things. Usually, if my physical isn't doing the best, um, probably my emotional isn't either. I'm having a hard time regulating my emotions or balancing them, right? And so, one of the things when we think about are the different dimensions of wellness and really thinking about where we fall in them is sometimes they're related. Right? Anyone know where I'm going with that? Okay. Um, so, talked about the physical, mental, that's engagement with the world through learning, problem solving, and creativity, doing puzzles, um, reading for fun. How many of you read for fun? Oh, you're better than me. As a college student, I read what my professors told me to read, and that was pretty much it, right? So I'm getting better now, I'm reading, and I'm reading like sci-fi type stuff just to kind of keep me kind of creative in my thinking, right? Um, emotional, being in touch with, aware of, and accepting, um, and able to express one's feelings and those of others. That one's not always easy, right? And, and one of the things I think someone mentioned, um, being able to, to really hold, be in touch with your emotions, sometimes being aware of it is even harder, right? Because we're not always aware or present. Um, to know where we are in those emotional um, aspects. Spiritual, our search for meaning and purpose um, in human existence, and that doesn't have to be religious, right? And so if we think about being in touch with nature, sometimes that falls under spiritual. Uh, social, connecting with, interacting with, and contributing to other people in our communities. Um, so going back to cultural humility, that one falls Really strong is very related, I would say. Um, and again, we'll talk about cultural humanity a little bit more. Uh, environmental, so a healthy physical environment free of hazards. Awareness of the role we play, uh, bettering rather than um, you know making the, the environment worse. Um, but also, so when I am having a hard time with stress, say that, um, the first thing, the first sign is if you get in my car, it is a mess. You can always tell when I am having a hard time emotionally or I'm stressed out because my environment, my car shows it, right? And so oftentimes, sometimes our homes or our rooms will be that way, right? And so making sure that our environmental or the things around us um, is, is safe is good, is important. And then financial, having a financial plan, plan uh, having occupational concerns and sticking with the budget. So we think about all of those dimensions of wellness, right? How many of you are like, yeah, I knew that we had all of those dimensions of wellness. Yeah, and some of us not. So it's important when we think about it, it's not just there's mental health. There are so many different aspects and so many different dimensions that make us who we are, especially when it comes to wellness. Any questions or comments about that before I move on? It's okay, sir. So. Yeah. All right. Now I'm a counselor. I can sit in silence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this thing, this cultural humility thing. Anyone ever heard of cultural humility? Yeah? couple people. What about cultural competency? That one's a little bit more common. Okay. So when you think about cultural competency, what are some things you think about? Just the term competency. What are some terms that you think about? I mean, competency and confidence is just 
you know, being like being like very much like, yes, I am correct. This is, I am doing the correct thing. I am very like, I feel good about myself. I feel like this, I am doing good. Yes. So having confidence in your knowledge about something um, and feeling like you understand it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Competency, cultural competency. Yes. I would say it has an aspect of exposing yourself to a lot of different kinds of people. Mm, I like that. Yeah. So it sounds. So when you said exposing yourself, it sounds like that's something you have to intentionally. Do. Yeah. Having an understanding and searching for an understanding of people with different cultures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So searching for the understanding, having that understanding. Anything else come to mind? Cultural competencies. Competence. When I think about competency, I think a little bit about like a checkbox, right? Having um, sort of this is the minimum, this is what I need to know to be knowledgeable or to be um, competent, um, to perform whatever task, to do whatever it is, right? So when we think about cultural humility, um, it's the ability to interact, to work, and to develop meaningful relationships with people of various cultural backgrounds. The focus is on understanding, so someone said having the understanding of others and acknowledging, though, our own cultural values, our biases, and our attitudes towards cultural difference. So part of this here, acknowledging our own cultural values, is really important. That's a main focus, right? It's also the thoughtful and intentional interaction with and understanding of people from various backgrounds, while respecting the cultural differences and similarities. So cultural humility was developed by Drs. Mellon and Tegelum and Jan Murray Garcia in 1998. It was primarily used in the healthcare field, um, but a lot of folks are using it now um, in addition to cultural competency, right? What do you think the difference is? Now that you've heard some folks' um, idea of what competency is, cultural competency, and then you have the definition here of cultural humility, what are the big differences? I imagine cultural humility as something like working towards understanding other cultures and cultural competency is whenever you feel like you've reached a point where you feel sure of how you relate to others and all these other cultures. Mm -hmm. So one is like the continuing kind of striving, mm -hmm. right? The other one is like, you, you know you got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something. I was, was going to say that competency is kind of like just maybe knowing more about other cultures and the humility is more just trying to understand uh, you know, be more intentional I mm. guess about understanding mm -hmm. yeah maybe the behaviors that go with the understanding I noticed before none of us mentioned acknowledging our own biases and any biases that we may have towards people of different cultural backgrounds mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so acknowledging it and then doing something with it yeah I saw other hands yeah. I feel like humility goes a step beyond competency because most of us feel pretty competent when it comes to culture, especially if we have privilege. Um, but humility is recognizing that we we might know where we think we are in, in a cultural framework, but that doesn't really tell us where other people are. Ooh. I would thank you so much for that. So I wonder if maybe when you think about the humility part of it, it's being okay with not knowing. Yeah. Right? And so um, when you think about being humble, um, it's really being okay with not knowing all of the things, but being intentional about trying to understand. Yeah? So you're absolutely right. It takes it a step further. It really includes some behaviors that come with it, right? We can have the understanding and we have to search 
out opportunities to know people who are different than us or the same, right? That's great. Anything else come to mind? Did I miss any hands over here? I was kind of focused this way. Do you like my way of saying anyone over here have something to say? <laughs> All right. So we talked around um, culture a little bit by talking about culture with one another. So when we think about culture, what are some things that come to mind? Kind of throw them out. What are some things we think about? What is culture? What are some things that come to mind? Beliefs. Beliefs. Absolutely. Tradition. Tradition. Traditions. Beliefs. Traditions. Ethnicities. Ethnicities. Yep. Socioeconomic background. Yes. S E S. Socioeconomic background. Language. Language. Mm -hmm. The way that we communicate. Religion. Religion. Expectation. Expectations. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, well, it, like what is expected of you within a culture, uh, for example, I'm Russian, it's expected that you will take your shoes off mm -hmm. when you enter a house. Yeah, so norms too, norms, expectations also. Some other things that come up. Nobody said race, so I'm going to say that. Race? <laughs> yep, let's go on. Relationships? Relationships, yep. Nationality. Nationality. It's good. Gender identity. Yep. Gender identity. Sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is a good one. Who knew you were going to have to think? Elements here. <laughs> yeah? Dogs, cats, both. How many dogs do we have? Yeah. What about cats? What about both? Rabbits? <laughs> Any rabbit owners? So our hobbies, our pastimes, the things that we are really passionate about, that's included. What about food and diet? Tell your next people, point it that way and it goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when we think about culture, here's one of the, um, the definitions that we use. It's the characteristic features of everyday existence. And it's shared by people in a place of time. So when I came in here, you all actually already had a culture established. Right? So you have expectations. Um, it, was, it was so interesting. Um, I'm forever a scientist and an, an observer. So I was, a, I was sitting over there to see people come in and some people sign and then maybe walk around it and some some was like, don't forget to sign, right? Like so there there were traditions and norms and all of the things already established, right? So you have that culture already. It's a set of shared values, beliefs, and norms of a group, which is generational um, and influences the way that we think and the way that we behave. So when we think about it being generational, culture is passed down from generation to generation, but it's also passed up. So I have three children. One is 26, one's 15, and one is 14. And I have learned so much from my children about social media, about all kinds of stuff, right? So they teach me just as much as I teach them. So, gener so it's passed up and down through generation to generation. It's the integrated patterns of human behavior, and that includes our thoughts, the way that we communicate, um, the different actions, the customs, and beliefs that we hold, um, our values, um, and institutions of race, ethnicity, uh, our religious institution, and other social groups. So it really does, when we think about culture, it shapes the, the way that we see the world, right? We, we, we would call that our worldview. So our worldview is the lens through which we see the world. And our worldview really is impacted by who we were raised by, where we were raised 
what we've seen, what we haven't seen, um, our traumatic experiences. All of those things really do impact our world. Does that make sense? Okay, so if we had um, enough time to do a cultural humility lab, and hopefully um, some of you will be able to experience it, one of the things that we would have done is kind of broken up in groups. And what I say is, in your small group, like eight or nine people or whatever, um, kind of list out all of the different aspects of culture that are represented in your group. And what happens is the group then writes down all of the different aspects when it comes to um, the region, right? So I'm from Ohio. I'm from Ohio. Shocker, <laughs> right? O H I O. Y'all are supposed to say I O. Okay. Um, so I'm from Ohio, and um, when I so I moved here 15 years ago, and um, when I first came here. It was very interesting when we think about um, communication, right? I would be walking on campus, or I would be um, in, in a building, like, whatever, going to class. And folks would, like, be speaking to me. I would turn around and be like, who are these people talking to? Right? Because I didn't know them. Right? Because where I'm from, you don't always talk to people that you don't know. Right? Because I'm from Ohio, and just, yeah. I was saying that I'm from Illinois, and this is my first semester, like, this is my first time here. And even just the different, like, things that, like, things are called so much different here than there. And, like, shopping carts and buggies, like, everything Buggy. is different when it's here to there. And yeah. you can definitely see, like, where people are from. Absolutely. Thank you for that, right? And it's so interesting because as you are in a place for so long, you kind of adapt to some of the things. So now when I walk my dog... I speak to every car that passes me. <laughs> every car. I'm like, hey, you know, I speak to everyone. And when someone else doesn't speak to me, I'm like, so <laughs> Right? So some of those, those are some of the things, thank you, um, that you would list, right? Where you're from, where you were raised, um, and maybe the food that you like, or maybe the sports teams that you like. All of those things, right? And so at the end, we then have a conversation about one, why is it important for us to be aware of other folks' aspects of culture, right? Um, and also, in addition to that, not just what we see, what we actually observe, but how that person identifies. Because oftentimes, we put folks in boxes as people we make sense out of the world by categorizing things and people, right? But we don't always do it the way that other people see themselves. Does that make sense? Or who they are. And so oftentimes we put folks in boxes that they don't really belong in. Does that, does that make sense? So one of the things that we talk about is why is it important for us to be aware of other folks and, and their aspects of culture. And then we put it together in terms of how will this help us in whatever we want to be, whatever we want to do when we grow up. Um, so we also kind of open up and we'll say, um, introduce yourself and tell us what you want to do when you grow up. Typically when I introduce myself, I say, my name is Michelle and I want to be retired. Right? <laughs> um, so in my retirement, it's going to be important for me to be able to relate to others, right? Because I plan on traveling the world and doing all of the things, right? So why is it important for, for me to have understanding of all of these different aspects of culture, not only for other folks, but for myself as well, and how that plays into my emotional, mental wellness, right? And so when we think about how mental wellness and cultural humility are connected, it really gives us the opportunity to humanize others and ourselves. Has anyone heard, um, so I'm a counselor, and so I've been in practice for a long time, and one of the things that I tell my clients is, you have to give yourself grace. Has anyone heard that? Mm -hmm. Give yourself grace? Yeah. It's important. We don't always do that. Sometimes we're harder on ourselves than we are on other folks, or how you know, other folks are hard on us. But it humanizes other people, and it humanizes us. It highlights some of the connections that we have, 
And so um, thinking about, so Dean, are you from Ohio too? Yeah, Cleveland. Right? Yep. Cleveland. Okay. Yep. So I lived in Cleveland for a while. We just made a connection, right? And had we not been talking about some of the aspects of culture, we never would have known that. Okay? So also thinking about getting outside of our own biases. Um, so how many of you have heard of F1 racing? Yeah. It's one of my favorite things to watch. Who knew? I surprised myself. <laughs> right? And so really being open um, to someone not fitting in the boxes that we put them in in our minds, that really does help us with highlighting those connections. It leads to having empathy for others. It also emphasizes the shared lived experiences associated with being human. Focuses on similarities and differences. So one of the things that happens when we do that exercise that I was talking about, when we list out all of the different um, aspects of culture that are represented, there are more similarities than differences that are brought up in those conversations. And so often when we think about culture and we think about diversity, we think about the differences. And it's also important to think about the similarities, the things that really bring us together, right? Um, then it can fulfill several dimensions of wellness by having those connections, right? So social wellness, when we think about that, we think about emotional wellness, all of those things are connected. What questions do you have or comments? Mine's just sort of a question or, or an observation. I think in that last list you were giving Dr. Stevens, thinking about all the ways in which we, our, our humility, our cultural humility, and maybe that's a very type of personal humility as well, allows us to give somebody else the benefit of the doubt. I, I told the students last week that a particular podcast or radio show that I just value listening to more than I can say is called No Small Endeavor. And I think it was not yesterday, but the week before that, there was a, a psychologist counselor on there who was talking about that the greatest form of grace is being able to say, is not, it, I could phrase it in a lot of different words, but one way is to not jump to judgment, which I think we as human beings do so quickly. Mm -hmm. We want to call somebody out. We want to see something that hurt my feelings. We want to assume the worst about that person. But to always be in this loving posture of giving someone the benefit of the doubt and to say, oh, they didn't really mean that when they stabbed at my heart. Um, they must have had a bad day, or I'm sure I misunderstood that. Um, that takes an enormous amount of adulthood. How do we achieve that capability? I think we try. <laughs> I think that's the first step, right? We try to do that. You're absolutely right. We, we live in a call-out culture. Right? So one of the, the things that we talk about when we do the Cultural Humility Lab, we set norms um, in the beginning, and we talk about calling in versus calling out, or calling out versus calling in. Um, and so I think one of the things that you're talking about is calling someone in. And so what are some things that come up when you think about calling someone out? Uh, blaming. Blame. Yeah. Yeah, and not always in a nice way, right? I think about social media, yeah, when people show receipts. Confrontations. <laughs> Confrontations. Confrontations, yeah, absolutely. So when I think about calling someone in, it is having that grace. It's being able to um, kind of invite them to learn about you, to learn about how whatever, whatever they said, whatever they did, them sit right with you or hurt you, right? So it's inviting them inward, in, um, rather than calling them out. So I think we try to do that. I think we have, um, I, I think we have to be intentional about it. How can we um, join in in a cultural humility lab? What a great question. <laughs> you tell your professors you want one, though. Um, so right now, the labs are um, being offered. We've actually expanded. So we're in the College of Education doing some of those. Um, but if you're in uh, any organizations, 
um, student organizations, we will come and do one for you. And so if you, um, I can send the uh, website information so that you all will be able to access it. Um, but on our website, if you type in Fairness, Justice, Equity, or FJE Center, um, there's a button on the side that says Request a Cultural Humility Lab. So we do do those for student organizations, um, so we can do that if they're not offered in your classes. So we are in the College of Education. We do some English classes. We're in social work, and mm, we added a couple of new ones just this semester as well. Just Yes. Um, I was just wondering some ways we could put this into daily practice. I'm not the kind of person that goes around and gets in conflict with everybody like every single day. So I'm, I'm in classes with a bunch of diverse people. Yeah. And, I've, and we just need to be able to talk to you about this, you know, mm -hmm. or anything like that. How somewhere that we can put it in practice I mean, other than just general kindness? Yeah. Uh, so thank you. That's a wonderful question. I think. Part of our responsibility is to um, not only to interact with folks who are different than us, um, but to really explore, right, and to um, kind of search on your own some of the information that you need in terms of knowledge, right? And so listening to podcasts, um, getting information. Um, outside of just asking the person because sometimes we don't know about folks in the different identities that they hold because it might not be safe for them to share it, right? Um, also, I think building trust so that they do feel safe sharing, I think that's another one. So actually having, um, creating genuine relationships with someone. Um, some other things is, you know, we appreciate Oftentimes, we appreciate different aspects of, of cultures. Um, when we think about food, right, I think we can appreciate food, we can appreciate different aspects, but really being able to appreciate some of the history. So going back to um, some of the aspects, right? Knowing someone's history, knowing some of the conflicts, knowing some of the different things that have impacted their family, um, and maybe it's not their family, but maybe the, the culture that they identify with or the country that they come from, right? Knowing some of that history, doing that research yourself is, is a good idea too. Um, and so there's, there's another um, slide that I can add. So in addition to the website, I will um, send their steps to in increase or improve our cultural humility. I'll send that as well, and it has to be financial steps. Is my time up? Pretty much, huh? More questions? Any other questions? This was the one of, yes. So uh, I was just going to ask real quick. Um, I'm just kind of a little curious. What got you really into analyzing all about cultural humility and mental wellness and all? That is an amazing question. Um, so I have always been interested in people who look different than me, um, who had different experiences than me uh, from a very early age. I also have experienced um, some difficulties and sometimes um, some, some stereotypes um, that come with all of the isms. And um, in counseling in particular, uh, so I taught multicultural counseling, in counseling in particular, I wanted to make sure um, that we were developing counselors who could relate to anyone, not just folks that were similar to them just by looking at them, right? And so having that passion, having my own mental health um, experience, um, with a counselor who didn't necessarily see me as a black woman, as I identify, right? Um, they saw me as a client, not necessarily thinking about all of the ways that my identity comes in and, and, and impacts my wellness and my mental health. Knowing that that was a huge, um, that was huge for me, and it could have deterred me from, from trying to get help, um, like counseling and things like that, I wanted to make sure 
that um, that didn't happen with some of the, the counselors that we were making. And so it was really important for me to spread the news of we should be able to relate to everyone, especially if we're in a helping profession. But I think it also goes into, so now I'm really helping folks become teachers. It's the same, right? So that's where that passion comes from. I have another question up there. Sorry, I have another question. Um, I'm in school for psychology myself, going to be a counselor. What books or anything might talk to you after about um, yes. books that I can research? To you? Yes, let's talk. I'm just going to ask the same question. So, if you have a couple of big ones on cultural humility, if you could throw them out there. Okay, so I just said I was going to send you a whole bunch of stuff. So hopefully I'll remember. Because so, <laughs> <laughs> I do have, we have a reading list that would be helpful. Would you post all this on our future teacher? Yes. How do you invite someone into learning your culture and understanding your cultural background when they have made an assumption that is different without making them feel bad? And I know a lot of times when we make a mistake, we as humans can get defensive. How do you invite someone into learning your culture and you explaining it without confrontation? Yeah, I think it's kind of the same answer as um, calling in versus calling out. Really, but also creating a relationship and building trust. Because oftentimes, when we think about folks who are defensive, even though if they have wronged someone, maybe not intentionally, a lot of that has to do with guilt and shame that comes in, right? And so I would imagine creating a relationship, a genuine relationship, to be able to give them that information and then receive it and do something with it that's not harmful to you would be a good step. Does that, does that make sense? Well, this was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so did everyone enjoy all of my very basic Canva. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the resources are there as well. So you'll get the slides, I'm sure, um, and you'll get those. Y'all, I failed to mention um, in creating our classroom culture that I was going to provide um, name tents. Okay. <laughs> class, class. Anyone who's been in the classroom before knows that I do this because we have guest speakers and they'll be able to call on you by your name and know who you are. So don't take them home with you. Just leave them here at um, this corner desk if you're walking out. Thank <laughs> you.